Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Episode number 134, The Blake Sloan Hockey Journey, Part 1. Presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we take a stroll around the park with a dude that just won, hear the incredible hockey life of our next guest, Blake Sloan, and begin this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's SweetHockeyCoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. I can't wait to share my next guest, Blake Sloan's hockey journey, because it is truly remarkable. Let me quickly summarize it in a couple sentences. Broken ankle, broken face, high school championship, NCAA national champion, Stanley Cup champion, a Europe Professional League championship, and was on the bench when one of his Michigan teammates introduced the world to the now famous, the original Michigan move and lacrosse style goal. Though he accomplished and experienced a lot of the good stuff during his incredible hockey journey, unfortunately, the road he traveled wasn't scripted to perfection, not having any challenges or hardships along the way where everything just came easy for him. That doesn't happen for anyone, and Mr. Sloan was no exception. If you want to hear the story of a kid who let his character, work ethic, adaptability, and never give up mentality until you get what you want, then buckle up, because we're in for a wild ride. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Blake Sloan to the show. Mr. Sloan, welcome to the Hockey Journey Podcast. You know, Lance, I've been... uh watching and listening to some of your stuff for a while and I've just been waiting for the opportunity to get on with you so I appreciate you having me I didn't even know you played college hockey so wow cool this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> and and guess what the mighty blue machine is going to be in town next week oh I know I know so good luck to you guys he means Michigan doggone it. okay um well <laughs> anyways this is going to be fun there's a lot uh this real quick, this guy won a Stanley Cup champion, uh, national champion at uh, Michigan, was on the bench when the the Michigan, the, the now famous Michigan goal, Michigan move, whatever you want to call it, was done. He was on the bench during that game live. So we're going to get to all that. But uh, how I start all the shows where I'm interviewing someone is I'd like you to rewind the tape uh mm -hmm. let's take a moment look in the rear view mirror and go back to the beginning where'd you grow up what was your childhood like your parents siblings friends your introduction to hockey and other sports how you climbed the ladder basically tell the listeners in a nutshell what the heck it was like growing up Blake Sloan oh geez Lance that's a that's a lot there but uh yeah I was born and raised in Morton Grove Illinois, uh, a suburb just north of uh, Chicago, uh, probably about 20 minutes if there's no traffic, uh, right down 94. Um, one of the bigger suburbs right next to it is Skokie. So people kind of know Skokie and Evanston where Northwestern is. Uh, I was okay. about three and a half, four miles from Northwestern. Um, and uh, I grew up uh, a real active, uh, probably ADHD uh, before it was diagnosed. Um, you know, a uh, kid uh, had a lot of trouble uh, sitting still in class in school. Um, but fortunately, I had some very uh, uh, tolerant and, uh, uh, you know, welcoming teachers that really saw an opportunity to uh, kind of hone in uh, the, the, the educational side of things. Now, this is not to mention my, my mother was a, uh, a physical education teacher within that school district for 35 years. 
So she was very aware of the the uh, the, the teachers that I was uh, quote unquote being given uh, when I was in my grammar school. So uh, she had uh, often had conversations with those guys and gals and teachers that uh, you know would be the best fit for me uh, when I was at uh, when I was at school uh, in my grammar school there. Um, I grew up playing all types of different sports. I grew up playing baseball. I did a little soccer. Um, and then karate found a way into my life as well. Um, and that was, you know, probably one of my biggest mentors growing up. I started karate when I was about six um, and did that actively and competitively until I was about 16. Um, you know, and Sensei Kohn was uh, someone who kind of channeled and allowed me and gave me the ability and the tools to kind of focus and uh, it's just a, it's a fantastic sport. And any of you young people out there who get a chance to do something like that with a fantastic teacher, I, I wouldn't uh, hesitate in the slightest. It's a uh, fantastic opportunity for strength and flexibility and coordination and compete and all those things that we talk about for a well-rounded multi-sport athlete, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and not to mention, it gave me some really good, uh, tools and whatnot, uh, when I was in the classroom. Uh, which was really important to uh, my mom and dad. Um, I have one sibling who is two years younger than me, a sister. Uh, she still lives in Orland Park, Illinois, uh, to this day. And uh, she was active, also actively engaged in sports. Uh, both my mom and dad were, uh, were, I would say, sports fanatics. My mom was a gymnastics and cross country and track coach for 25 years. Uh, my dad grew up uh, in Chatham, Ontario, and I would say that he was the biggest influence in me getting involved with hockey as a young person because at that time in Illinois, um, the Blackhawks were never on TV. Um, so I never had a chance to follow the Blackhawks. I didn't have a team I followed. The only team that was in the area that I followed was uh, uh, the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, the, the Flames. So D1 hockey. So we would always look at the schedule and people would come down, you know, other teams would come in, NCAA hockey would come in and we would go see Air Force and we would go see University of Alaska Anchorage and we would get to see Bowling Green. So I grew up a big hockey fan, uh, a college hockey fan in that regard, and got to see a lot of good teams come in. Now, UIC wasn't a great team, so they got stomped a lot, but I was always you know, in the stands with the other uh, 3,000 people at most watching those games as a kid. Um, but uh, I think you know, my mom's influence and my dad's influence on me as a young person was just playing as many different things and keeping me as active as possible. Um, their philosophy from in parenting was uh, uh, the more things that uh, I was doing would uh, keep me out of trouble, quote unquote. Um, and they were exactly right. I, I really didn't have much time to, uh, you know, to find trouble. Uh, my buddies and I would find ourselves at the um, a park down the road playing flag football and tackle football. And we would play baseball down there and um, shoot. We had tennis matches and, and fast pitch against the brick side of a wall and all those sorts of sports that, you know, we would just do after school on a routine basis. And we had lots of fun doing that. Um, and then I found myself uh, with an opportunity to, to get into high school. Um, you know, my mom was kind of watching from afar at that point, And now I was uh, enrolled at Niles West uh, in Skokie there where she was a teacher. So that was an interesting experience for me being there, um, you know, with her in the same building, although she did do the physical education side with all the, all the, the, the girls. Um, so a lot of my friends, uh, you know, had her in class and, uh, fortunately I didn't have, a, I didn't have the opportunity, uh, to have her as a teacher. So, uh, but she was very aware of what was going on and, and that sort of stuff. So, uh, I think I'm probably unique in the sense that I ended up uh, going to four different high schools. And uh, um, so my first year was in Illinois and uh, we can get into the hockey side of it uh, later, but there was an opportunity for me to go to a prep school in Boston uh, my sophomore year. And I went out and uh, did an experience uh, for two years at Tabor Academy um, and then wound up playing junior hockey and transferred a couple of uh, a couple of years before I ended up at the University of Michigan. So um, not a normal childhood by any means, but uh, 
definitely something that allowed me the ability to adapt and uh, uh, meet all types of different people. Did you know? Did you have? Uh, I know you played a lot of sports and you did a lot of things with your, your neighborhood buddies and stuff at the park mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But did you do any off ice like shooting at home or at the park? Uh, did you? work with a, a skating instructor, a skills person? I mean, how did you kind of get to the point where you're like, okay, I want to I want to see how far I can take this hockey thing? Uh, I, there's two questions there, Lance. I think the first one is, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, uh, I had a little shooting area in the back of my house. Um, but honestly, you know, that was only used, uh, you know, in Chicago in the winter, you know, I'm, I'm playing a lot. Um, so, you know, I didn't have the setup that I get to see, uh, very often here in Plymouth, Minnesota, uh, where they have a, you know, an active area where you can shoot indoors kind of all year round, which is fantastic. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I would use my garage for stick handling. Um, at that time, I think the, the big thing was taking the, uh, the electrical black tape around a tennis ball and making that super tight. And that was sort of the, or golf ball. Uh, back in those days. And uh, we would stick handle and, and do things like that for hand eye and whatnot in the garage. Um, but, I, you know, that that's kind of the, the side piece of it. I, I think for me, um, you know, it, it's a little bit different now, Lance. It's, it's intriguing as I kind of sit from a parental view now and you see these activities that are going all year round, whether it's gymnastics or soccer or hockey or, or all of these different activities. Um, and, you know, my family, like many of the families around our area, you know, the hockey season ended, we'll call it uh, end of March or early April. Um, and shoot, I think the only time I picked up my skates in the summer was for a one week camp that I went to in Blenheim, Ontario. And to be perfectly honest, um, the reason that that happened was it was a chance for me to go up there. I would spend a week doing the camp with and stay with my grandpa. Uh, and then I would spend a week just visiting with him up there. So it was kind of an opportunity for me to go up there and spend time with grandpa Jimmy. Uh, sure. and that was, that was probably the only time in the summer that I would skate until the age of about 12, to be honest. I, I, you know, the baseball glove came out, um, and I was, you know, so excited at that point to, you know, get the baseball glove out and start hitting and, and, you know, getting my stroke back from the hitting standpoint. And when that ended, you know, in, you know, September, um, all of a sudden the skates came back out and I was just jazzed up and ready to go for, you know, for the year in hockey. So, um, you know, and intermixed in that was, was the karate I was doing and whatnot. So, um, you know, I, I think the skill development side of, of sports and any sport, it's, it's so elevated now in so many different ways. You know, you've uh, the nutritionist and the mental side and you've got the skating, you know, the development stuff. And I just talked with one of my buddies who's the assistant GM out in Seattle for the Kraken. And he said, Blake, it's really interesting. It's, you know, you've got these teams and our team is made up of basically 23 individual entities with like a supporting cast that supports this one player, you know, like they have their sports psychologists and their doctors and all this stuff. Right. And now it's like this sort of, uh, team within the team that you sort of have to go through and the agents and all these different things. So, you know, the landscape of it is so different now. Um, and I'm almost, you know, aging and dating myself when I say this stuff, because people listening might be like, geez, this guy's, you know, must be a hundred. Um, but it really, it, it happens really fast. I mean, even in my professional career of 17 years, you know, the, how the development of, you know, me as a professional and the strength tra- training evolved from the start of that all the way to the end. It's, it's, it's just, it's ever changing and, and very unique and, and specified now. So one common thread as you, as we kind of, how does my mom say say it? Finagle our way through your yeah. hockey life. Uh, this is a reoccurring thing that happens. Uh, you're you become a champion all the time. It seems like so. Your first one was in uh, one of the four high schools you're at. Talk about that, and then um, you ended up going to Michigan. So transition from winning the championship to. How did you end up at Michigan? Were there other uh, schools that were interested? How did that all happen? Yeah, I think even, 
even going back to when I made the decision to go out to prep school, Lance, uh, you know, I was still a, a, a really active and I loved baseball, like absolutely loved it. I wouldn't say I loved it more than hockey, but they were equal to me. Um, really? and to be honest, yeah, I loved, uh, I loved both sports equally in the season that I was in. I just totally thrust myself into it and just embraced the, the heck out of both of them. Um, and to be honest, one of the reasons I did make the decision as a, you know, the family decision to go out to prep school is I was cut from, uh, my only team in that area, you know, Chicago now is, I would say almost a hotbed of, you know, uh, with many, many, many different organizations and teams. And at the level that I was playing at, there was two teams. There was the Young Americans and Team Illinois. Um, and the Young American team, which I was playing for, uh, brought another kid in, uh, the defenseman, and I ended up not being asked to, to return that following year. So I really had no place to play uh, my freshman year in high school. Um, to be honest, at the time, I thought it was the biggest devastating thing in the universe. And the year that year as a freshman, um, I ended up trying out for a double A midget team. Um, uh, and you know, I've been very fortunate, Lance, to get an opportunity to play for, you know, some really influential coaches and whatnot. Um, and coach Mueller at the time brought me on board as a, you know, 130 pound freshman. And the entire team was made up of juniors and seniors. So oh. for the first time in my life, I had to figure out how to, you know, use my leverage as a strong little person to, you know, gauge my, you know, to, to, to it's physical, you know, the physicality of it was a huge step. Um, you know, as a parent now looking at my son, was that, would that be something I'd want to do? I mean, I look at, uh, you know, Zam plant and these guys that played varsity hockey as a freshman, um, you know, and he got his shoulder all, all blown out of place. I played with Derek, you know, in Dallas and he was saying, Blake, I, you know, that was kind of the skill set he was at. I was nowhere near the skill level, this level of a Zam plant. Let's be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> I was just trying to find a place to play that, you know, would give me a chance to develop. Um, and because I was cut from that team and I had that opportunity that year, um, I really put myself in a position then when I went out to Tabor uh, as a sophomore to really contribute to that championship winning team that we had out there. And, and we had some outstanding players at the time. There were kind of two trains of thought if you were going to leave home. Uh, and that was probably going up to St. Mike's in Toronto um, at that time, uh, which would have been a, a, a completely different experience, I'm sure. Uh, but the prep school scene at that time was a really great opportunity to not only get an unbelievable education, but I could also still play baseball. Um, and I knew many kids uh, out there um, that were going to, you know, the Babsons and they were going to, Col uh, you know, Colby, uh, Connecticut college, you know, at that time, Lance, honestly, I had aspirations of playing, you know, college hockey or college baseball of some sort, but never in my wildest dreams at that point, did I ever, you know, think that that was going to be something that was going to happen based on where I was in my developmental path. Yeah. When so, did, uh, um, I went out to Tabor, uh, played on an outstanding team uh, as a younger person. And you'll hear some of the common you know, threads throughout my, my talk here about the, the things I learned as a younger person, you know, and then evolving into, you know, being a quote unquote veteran or a leader on a team were kind of all these small situations. And it started as me being a freshman playing with juniors and seniors that first year as a midget. Um, and then I went to prep school and I had some unbelievable senior leaders on that team that kind of caught me, taught me how to work hard and uh, to commit to doing something, you know, bigger than yourself and doing something for a team. Um, and then I went to Michigan and had the fortune, uh, the great fortune of playing with guys like David Oliver and Steve Shields and Cam Stewart um, and Brian Wiseman who were seniors at that time, um, who kind of indoctrinated me into the Michigan way um, and the things in the, you know, that Coach Barrettson really wanted to see out of individuals and, and thus the team. So when did you, you know, first, what, what year did you win the championship with uh, the prep school? And then, uh, you know, Talk a little bit about the, the recruiting process of going to Michigan because, 
you know, I got to think that there was more than one school interested. Uh, there were some, there were some schools interested. I actually had a, uh, I, I, you know, being a Chicago kid, um, Larry Pedry was the coach at UIC at that time. And he actually offered me a, a an opportunity to go there, uh, in early signing period, uh, as a junior. Um, so I had an opportunity to go to UIC and play at home and do those sorts of things. And at that time, I just, you know, wasn't, uh, in a position in my life or my career to make that decision. Um, you know, at that time, Lance, you're still, you know, I went to school as a, you know, right as at five years old, I just turned five. Um, so there was no holding back or any of the stuff that sort of happens now. Um, so I was still developing and still learning to play. Um, and that was when I was still at Tabor. Um, the coach that I had gone out to play for at Tabor, um, ended up, uh, leaving and going to join a junior team. Um, and at that point, two years of prep school, if, if you know anything about the rigors and I know you do with having Rem at Shattuck, uh, Tabor was a very aggressive, uh, academic place. And I, every single night I'd have two to two and a half hours of homework, uh, mandatory study hall from seven o'clock to nine. Um, and after two years of that, to be honest, it, it was wearisome. And, you know, I was like, Hey, I think I've kind of got my habits down. I've got my rhythm down. I think I'd like to try something different. At that point, I, you know, played some summer hockey. I did some hockey night in Boston tournaments and went and joined the first year that the Boston Junior Bruins um, was assembled uh, for a oh, guy wow. by the name of Ted. Yeah, for the guy by the name of Ted Kelly. And the Boston Junior Bruins are still around, but we were the first yeah. team. And we had 13 guys from that team play D1 hockey. Um, and the other eight were, you know, probably convicts or dropouts from school. Um, so we had a very eclectic bunch of guys in <laughs> our team, but we, we could stick and play. And, uh, we did a tour, uh, our first tournament that year was in Toronto, uh, where Billy Powers, the assistant coach from Michigan was there. I think Red was there as, as well from, from Michigan. Um, and they came down and talked to me after that um, and said, we'd be interested in having you come for a visit at some juncture. Would you keep Michigan on your radar? And I said, absolutely. Uh, they called me that week and they said, hey, we're not going to waste your time unless we're willing to offer you a scholarship to fly you out uh, here and look at Michigan until we're ready to do that. And that was code for saying, hey, we're looking at another kid. And we were waiting for him to decide, right? right. Um, and and two days later, uh, Coach Berenson called me and said, "Hey, Blake, uh, we'd like to fly you out on Thursday and come on out here." And I said, "Oh my goodness, uh, I'm supposed to be in a tournament this weekend." Obviously, my coach would have been like, "Yes, you're not going to the tournament. You're going to go out and see Michigan." Um, right. And I ended up going out to Michigan and doing uh, my official visit, quote unquote, and uh, they offered me a, a, an opportunity to come there. So at that point, honest to goodness, Lance, I had University of Illinois at Chicago and then I had Michigan to look at. And I was a huge you know, believer the first time I stepped on campus. I just I really enjoyed the campus. I knew what kind of academic institution it was. Um, and, you know they were also losing five or four defensemen that year. Uh, actually very, very, very excellent defensemen, you know, David Harlock and Chris Tamer, uh, oh, wow. um, uh, Aaron Ward was in that class that left as well. Uh, yeah. so they were leaving, you know, all, they were losing all American defensemen. <laughs> and then they were trying, they were going to replace that with me, you know, five foot nine, uh, defensemen. And, uh, I said, geez, I said, this is, and Coach Berenson, I just, I really liked his demeanor. I liked his approach. Um, and I really enjoyed, uh, I thought that that would be the best place for me to go. So there really wasn't a whole lot of looking around. And, you know, in my opinion, Michigan was the place for me, you know, right from the get go. It's amazing. Um, when I was doing my research for this episode, how both of our careers, um, you know, though years is decades later. How old are you right now? Uh, 48. 
40, so it's not that far, maybe not decades. Yeah, we're not that far <laughs> off, Lance. Come on. Almost a decade, but uh, it okay. does, they did, they parallel so many things. Like when I, I listen to to what, you know, for, same thing for me for, for uh, my re- college recruiting process. I got a couple letters in the mail from North Dakota, maybe St. Cloud. Uh, no, yeah. not even St. Cloud, but. Michigan Tech, and then you know, all of a sudden Minnesota came in and they offered a half scholarship, and I'm like, all right, I got no one else knocking down the door, so I uh, didn't even do a recruiting thing. So, anyways, there's more to come on that. Um, all right, let's talk about uh, the year. So you go to Michigan; uh, mm-hmm. they just are, are one of the premier programs uh, in the in the country year after year. And uh, I like to think Minnesota is too, but uh, <laughs> for sure, um, for sure. But you know, talk about the that's that special year that you guys won the national championship. Um, did right out of the gate, did you kind of say I, this is this year seems different, or how did it, how did it unfold? Well. So let's back up just one second, Lance. The, the thing that's interesting, when I got to Michigan, that senior class that I mentioned before, um, you know, with Harlock and Tamer and Neaton, you know, and Aaron Ward and these guys, um, and that class was kind of the first recruiting class where, you know, if you're, if you're a Michigan hockey fan at all, which probably not many people on the episode are, before that, you know, Redhead – many, many, many losing seasons. I mean, he took over a program in shambles, um, you know, didn't have a lot of direction and it took him a good 10 years before they started kind of on that path. And I think he would, he would attribute sort of the directional change when he recruited that class. So that was four years where they started to sort of win and they made the tournaments and they sort of just were knocking at the door. Right. And then my class came in and I think you could, probably say, you know, Red to this day would say that that was one of, you know, the best recruiting classes that he ever had. Um, And not because of a Blake Sloan, but, you know, a Brendan Morrison, a John Madden, a Warren Looning, a Jason Botterill, all guys drafted in the first and second round. That was kind of the next step of like the echelon of evolution where all of a sudden these guys were having to make tough decisions after their freshman and sophomore year, if they were going to stay. And, yeah. you know, after my freshman year, we had four guys that were seriously considering leaving and, you know, three of them were my roommates. Um, oh, right. And I'll get into the story later of how, you know, basically their agent was sitting in our, my house and was like, Hey Blake, do you want to play hockey next year? And I'm like, uh, yeah, but I have no money. And he's like, well, I'm going to represent you. And I'm like, okay, great. You know, that's pretty much how my professional career started. But it was because of those guys and their willingness to, you know, they came to Michigan to do something special. We had a a tremendous class. We had some great leadership, you know, in the classes above. And as sophomores, we came back and it just started this sort of transformation of like, you know what, we're not just going to start knocking on the door. We're going to start like the expectation now is to win. And that was like this sort of uh, evolution in the history of Michigan hockey. Um, And I think, you know, the program has taken leaps and bounds and steps, you know, beyond that even to this day. But I think it starts, you know, with with that initial class of, you know, the Harlocks and the Neatons and those guys and sprinkled in a few other guys even prior to that. And, you know, the Felsners, Denny Felsner was there. They got him to come in there. Um, And all of a sudden this evolutionary change, kind of, kind of happened. And, uh, um, you know, the expectations changed from like, you know, we didn't have a building with a thousand people in it. Like you couldn't even get student tickets. Um, you know, people were, were rab, you know, rabid to come see it. Um, it kind of became one of the most challenging and difficult places to play in America. As far as Yoast, you got 7,000 fans that are just right on top of you, the way that that the seating is in that place. Um, and, all of a sudden it just, it, it really just helped to propel the next generation of recruiting classes. Marty Turco Kim comes in after that as a freshman and he takes over for Steve Shields. And, um, it just continues this, this great legacy of players that come in after that. And I, I give coach Berenson and, and Mel Pearson and Billy Powers, who are the assistants there, a great amount of credit for 
bringing in a lot of very talented players, but all players from uh, different walks of life, a kid from BC and Calgary and, you know, a kid from Toronto, a kid from Chicago. And all of a sudden you're like, hmm, how do we all get along and, and, you know, promote this program and help it win, you know? So it was fun. It's just, it was such a, a special place to be. And um, I'm just uh, extraordinarily grateful to have had the opportunity to be honest. So one other thing, I think it was the year that you won the, the national championship, but it was the game going into the finals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, you're sitting on the bench, just getting a squirt of greater aid and something happens. And you're like, did I just see what I just saw? Talk about that. Well, that was the, you know, the kids call it now the Michigan. And I'm like, you know, Mike Legg should, you know, have that thing patented and be getting all the accolades for that, you know, as far as I'm concerned. But at that time, there was one other person, uh, and his, his last name was Armstrong, who had did it in a professional game for the Detroit Vipers. And uh, I think he had done it a year before that. And the funny thing about the story is, you know, after practice, everyone screws around and does different things. And Coach Berenson would usually stay on the ice for a few minutes. And, um, you know, at 62 years old of, of when he was, depending on if, you know, you were playing a lot, he would, he would race guys up and down the ice. He would work on people's backhands. He would, you know, always do things that are things that you should be working on. Well, Leger would stand down there and try to do that stupid Michigan behind the net. And I remember him on several occasions skating behind him and say, Leger, do something that's actually going to, you're going to do sometime, you know, and just give it, give it a, give it a hard time about it. And if, if, if you know, Mike Legg and all, he's just a real happy go lucky. And he would kind of giggle and say, Oh coach, I'm going to do this sometime. I'm going to do this sometime. I promise. <laughs> and the fantastic thing about it is, is, uh, um, people forget that they think that that was the goal that kind of propelled us, you know, um, and won a national championship. Well, that was a game, ironically, against Minnesota. Um, and we were down two to one. And, and Minnesota, we we handled them fairly well throughout the year. And they were just, they had us our number that game. And it was late in the second period. And we were just, we were getting hemmed in and hemmed in. And we finally got an opportunity where, where Legger gets behind the net. And I can just see it now where the two defensemen just kind of sit on the post and he goes down and in a matter of a half a second, you know, reaches around and lacrosse is this into the net. And it's the first time in my life I've ever seen Coach Berenson like smile or smirk on the bench. And we just <laughs> all kind of looked at him and and we thought he was going to go crazy for a minute. And that tied the game up. And in the third period, it just you, you, you kind of felt this sort of like, oh, my gosh, that just really happened now. OK, let's just play hockey now. And all of a sudden the team just kind of took it to the next level. We ended up scoring early in the third period and scored one more and ended up, uh, uh, you know, get that, uh, getting us into the frozen four. It was called, still called the final four at that time in Cincinnati after we beat the Gophers in that game. As my father-in-law, who is a diehard Gopher fan, tells me, Blake, that was an illegal goal. Um, and that was a <laughs> cheater goal. Um, you know, so I, I have to deal with, you know, living in Minnesota now and people still ask me about that, uh, that, you know, yeah. And now I'm old enough to say, uh, yeah, I was, I was, that was one of my uh, classmates at Michigan. <laughs> so, but super proud of uh, Mike Legg for pulling something ridiculous like that off. But that was kind of the team that we were at that time and uh, a little bit of swagger, but not in a million years would I have ever thought he was actually going to try that silly thing and actually get away with it so that's that's such a great story because you know no one know you know you just think that all of a sudden that that kid just was born with you know able to do that but to, to hear that he was working on that you know at the end of practice anytime <laughs> he could all, all yeah. year for years and to be able to pull it off on, on that big of a stage is is pretty impressive and you know, that's why it's, uh, it's such a famous, uh, moment in time. It was, uh, it was special to be a part of no question, no question. So you win the national championship. What year was that? Was that your junior senior year? Uh, that was at my junior year. Um, and, uh, had a great, 
run, obviously in the in the final four there, and ended up playing BU, which BU's team was just absolutely jacked and loaded and stacked with you know Chris Drury and Mike Greer and all these guys that you know Jay Pandolfo guys that played years and years in the NHL. Um, we came out in that game and probably played our best game that we had played all year, uh, oh, wow. and just handed them a thumping of, I think three or four to one, I think it was three to one, but it wasn't even a contest. I don't think if you look back at the game, um, you know, we had just control of the game the entire time. And, uh, then, you know, ended up playing a Colorado college team, um, you know, uh, with, uh, Don Lucia at the helm. And I got to know Don and Tony here living in Minnesota now. And Don still, you know, asked me every day for, for his ring because we took it from him. And, you know, when I see him, um, so yeah, that's when I, I first came in contact with Don and, uh, um, you know, they had a fantastic team too, well coached, disciplined. Um, and we ended up beating them in the national championship game. So. Ouch. <laughs> yep. Yep. Thanks and, for that. Uh, yeah, it was a uh, outstanding, uh, ex- outstanding run, and I, I still think our senior year was probably, and, and Barons would say this was probably our best, our best team that we ever had at Michigan. Um, the expectations for for us to to win again, and you know, we went through the regular season and the playoffs and got to the uh, Frozen Four and ended up having a rematch against uh, uh, BU, um, and BU wasn't as talented, uh, but they ended up beating us uh, in the semifinal game. Um, and that was probably the most disappointing thing I'd ever been a part of up until that point in my career. Cause we just were, we were on a mission and playing like, yeah. you know, playing like men possessed and, uh, they came out and that's what's so, so stinking difficult in one game series. It, anything can happen at any juncture and they got the best of us that night for sure. Yes. I, I say, ouch, just because, you know, the Gophers recently got eliminated. Um, it's, it's, it's tough because, you know, you, you think about, you know, the opportunities I, I got to play in three, you know, uh, final fours and closest I got was double overtime. And, uh, so I didn't mean to, uh, you know, take anything away from what you guys accomplished by saying that, uh, congratulations. I'm really happy for you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank You're you. very welcome. <laughs> well, the Gophers were always a uh, very formidable foe that uh, we got to play three or four times a year. At the uh, there was a tournament in Wisconsin that we always play them in. Then we usually see them in a in a semi or in a regional tournament, um, you know. And then we played. Sometimes it was a they came. We played them a couple times, usually one or two times early in the year too. So, um, you know, the, the formidable WCHA was always a good one to play against for sure. And I, you know, that's the first time I ran into Mike Crowley and uh, as a defenseman in my, you know, day and age, I just, I tell him to this day, I used to chase him around the ice and I, he was all over the place. I couldn't stop that guy. Um, yeah. Probably one of the most gifted skilled players I had ever seen. And he was behind the offensive net. And then six seconds later, he'd be at the, you know, be out at the blue line defending something. I'm like, how did the heck did he just get back there? You know? <laughs> so it was super fun to watch him. Uh, I hated playing against him, but super fun to watch when I was on the bench. <laughs> yeah. So I want to I want to shift gears here before we get to your professional career because I heard something in uh, one of the podcasts that I, I listened to that you were getting interviewed on. You know, mm-hmm. we think about the the hockey component, but there's a lot of other things going on in a person's day besides hockey. Um, and that's being, you know, you go to you go to school, you're going to get a degree. Uh, talk about maybe the some of the, your teammates uh, that you played with there at Michigan. Um, maybe they didn't accomplish what you did uh, at in the NHL, and but man, there's some successful uh, people in the in the business world making this place better than before they found it. Yeah, it, it it's it's a pretty special group, and uh, you know I, I got to give the credit all to that to to Coach Berenson, To be honest, I mean he was uh, super adam- adamant and super passionate about you know 
what the next steps were in our lives. Um, always. I mean, I had played 10 years of uh, professional hockey and had won a Stanley Cup and I'd be back in Ann Arbor and he's like, hey, do you know what you're going to do when you're done yet? And I'm like, coach, I, I still got, f- you know, five, six years left in me. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, you you need to be thinking about it. And every single time. Um, and he starts that as, you know, freshman year about, you know, hey, are you going to class? What are you interested in? What are you liking to study? And you got to remember his background too. He, uh, you know, left Michigan a little bit early, uh, joined the Montreal Canadiens, won a Stanley Cup with the Montreal Canadiens and was back at business school, finishing up his finals exams uh, a day and a half later. So no it's a guy that, yep, it's a guy that is completely invested in, in his education, um, completely invested in, in the players that played for him and making sure that, that we had educations and what we were going to do and a fallback plan and all these different things. And, you know, he didn't feel like he's just, you know, it, it wasn't just a hockey factory. He's more proud of the guys, you know, we on my team that won the national championship, we have three uh, brain surgeons for Pete's sake on that team. Uh, yeah. Uh, awesome. like ve- very, very, very accomplished, well-written and researched, you know, like brain surgeons. One of them is at the university of Florida and heads up the whole ne- uh, neurological department at the university of Florida. Um, one's down in Arizona. Uh, we have an orthopedic surgeon that's up in green Bay that works with the green Bay Packers, you know, Harold shock. Uh, we have a, um, uh, we have a lawyer, um, we have an assistant general manager. We've got three or four people that run their own businesses. Um, you know, these are all highly, highly successful, well-rounded, uh, passionate individuals that are, that are just doing great things in the world. Um, and he speaks about those guys way more than he speaks about the Brendan Morrison's that, uh, that won a Hobie Baker and the Blake Sloan's that won a Stanley cup or the John Madden's he's super, uh, proud and, you know, feels responsible as he well should, you know, for those guys doing such great things after they were done playing. Well, that is awesome. Um, because, you know, you think about today, we are so invested in our kids and you kind of lose sight that, you know, the, what's, what's the real, real goal. Um, you still want to be able to chase that big dream, but we also have to take Red's advice. You know, what, what's what's going to happen when it's all said and done? That is great messaging. You got lucky with that guy. Yeah, I uh, I was very blessed. And he's a, he's a special person to me. And I know he's a special person for a lot of people that he's, you know, touched along the way. It's uh, I was pretty, pretty fortunate to have him in my life for sure. So how do we transition into pro hockey? Because uh, <laughs> I, I think that you were kind of just being the, the secretary for your roommates to, to their agents and uh, mm-hmm. something happened uh, and take it from there. Yeah, I was uh, literally, you know, just a secretary at that time. We didn't have the cell phone. So, you know, uh, we had uh Jason Botterill, who's my roommate for four years at Michigan. Um, he was drafted by Dallas 19th overall in the first round. So his agent would, you know, call consistently. Um, Brendan and Warren Looning had uh, a guy by the name of Kurt Overhart. Um, and, you know, Kurt's business has now exploded, but Kurt was an, and ended up being the guy that uh, I think I may have been maybe one of the first guys that, as he was starting his niche at the college ranks back in the day, um, he wanted to invest his time in a quote unquote dark horse. And, you know, as he's sitting in the house one day, I'm, you know, waiting for Brendan and Warren to come back from class. He's like, Hey, what are you, what are you going to do next year? And I'm like, well, (laughs) I I think I'm going to teach. And he's like, he's like, Oh, that's interesting. He said, well, if I could find you a place to play, would you want to play? And I'm like, yeah, yeah think that would be great. And, you know, I, I said, well, Kurt, I, I don't have any money. He said, well, if I get you an opportunity, we'll, you know, we'll figure that out after the fact, you know, it's just, it's a fee after that. Like, but I have to get you a job and you got to make the team. And I said, oh, sounds great. So I ended up leaving school. I did a bunch of interviews for some teaching uh, uh, opportunities and, you know, trained all summer. 
And I'm like, man, I haven't heard from this Kirk guy in a while, you know, and it's, it's August 1st. And I, you know, I call him and I say, Kurt, what's, uh, what's going on? He said, Hey, I'm working on a couple things, you know, and anyone who's de dealt with an agent, it's interesting. I, I'm very good friends to Kurt to this day, but I bust his chops. Obviously he's not going to be spending a crap ton of time on a guy like me. That's just, you know, going to maybe get an opportunity to make a minor league team at some point. Right, right. So he's like, I got, I got a couple of things in the mix, you know, and, and uh, I said, okay, well, you know, when you, you thinking about sharing that with me? And he's like, well, I, I think in about two weeks. So it gets to be about August 20th, you know, August 30th, you know, finally he calls me. He said, Hey, I, I have an opportunity for you. It's, it's with the Houston arrows. You're going to go down and uh, try out for the team. And I'm like, perfect. I know like Brian Wiseman from Michigan is there. David Oliver's there. Cam Stewart's there. So three guys from, you know, that were seniors when I was a freshman are there. So I, I know a couple guys that's outstanding, you know? Yeah. And he's like, well, there's some, there's some bad news to that too. And I said, well, okay, what's that? He said, well, they keep seven defensemen and they've already got eight that are under contract. And I'm like, well, okay. And he's <laughs> like, well, and there's also 10 other guys that are going to be there at the tryout. And I'm like, well, <laughs> Kurt, I'm not a math guy. I'm an English guy. But like that doesn't seem like a very good opportunity to me. <laughs> and he, he's like, he's like, well, it is what it is. I mean, you got to go down and make a team. So I went down there. Wow. And I remember getting off the plane in Houston, um, and it was a you know Houston weather. It's it's uh, August you know twentieth or something. You know August thirtieth, September first. I mean, I get off the plane and it's like one hundred and fifteen degrees, and I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. My my flip flops were. I could feel them melting on the tarmac as I walked off the plane. It was so stinking hot. And I'm like, how do people play hockey here? Like, this is ridiculous. Um, but I end up going in and the, the coach at, there at the time was a guy by the name of Dave Tippett. And uh, I go through the first week of training camp and they start making cuts and getting guys out of there. And all of a sudden we get down to an exhibition game and I'm in the lineup and I'm playing in the exhibition game. And um, he's still got nine defensemen there. And two days later, he's he's got to make a decision on how many guys he's going to keep around. Um, he ends up trading two guys, um, and he calls me in the office and he said, "Blake, he said, uh, here's what I want to do. I like you've played really well. I want to keep you here, but I'm going to put you under a player tryout. Uh, it's a it's a ten day player tryout. So basically, you you're playing for your next you know contract ten days from now." And I said, well, I, I, I guess that's great. So I've been living at the hotel for a month now. I go back to the hotel. I ended up being in the hotel, um, the courtyard Marriott or something for almost three months. And I was playing from 10 day contract to contract to contract. And now hold on, hold on, I, hold on. Let this put this in the context. How many yeah. other, how many other, uh, teammates of yours were under a similar, contractual agreement with the team at that time yeah uh maybe maybe one maybe two yeah uh, I mean, but all the other, else, all, everyone yeah. else was signed yeah you know officially quote unquote signed for the year right yeah um so I, i'm living in the, I, i've got my my same suitcase i've been there for three months you know i'm i i got to know chris the bus driver who's driving me to the rink every day because i have no automobile uh, I ate breakfast with, with Martha and Samantha, who were the front desk ladies for two months. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was, it was bizarre. Uh, and the weirdest thing about it is like, I'm a college kid just graduating. I have zero money. Um, and I'm down there and like, as I, the most exciting part for me was every day that I was there, I was getting $55 cash in my pocket that like I could go out to eat with. I was like, this is freaking unbelievable. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. I'm like putting like 25 bucks in my pocket. I'm eating out like a king, you know, I'm like, this is, this is freaking brilliant. Um, and, uh, so tip finally calls me in the office. Uh, you know, it's gotta be damn near Thanksgiving at that time. And he says, uh, he looks at me and he says, Blake, he said, uh, you know, I, I I'm going to sign you for the rest of the year, um, and offer you a, an opportunity for next year. For a whopping twenty two thousand five hundred dollars, wow! And and uh, it was the minimum at the time in the IHL. And uh, 
he looked at me and said, yeah, you go get an apartment you can move out of the, move out of the, the courtyard. And he must've saw my face kind of like get scared or something. Cause he looks at me and says, what, what's wrong with you? This is where you say like tip, this is great. Thank you. You know, like I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, well, Dave, I'm like, I don't have any money to get a car. He's like, so let me guess, you don't have any money to get an apartment. I'm like, no. <laughs> so, I looked at, so he looks at me and he goes, all right. He goes, go talk to Karen. He goes, I'll give you an advance, you know, on your next couple of months, uh, you know, so you could go get, get a car and a Wow. Yeah. And uh, so he helped me out and, and uh, I went and ended up moving in with an old time buddy of mine, uh, spent 300 bucks a month on rent and went down to a car max. So if you ever want to learn about salesmanship and, you know, what it's like to be, you know, feel like a, a, a piranha in a, in a orca whale community, have, <laughs> have, have a hotel van drop you off at a car max with your hockey bag and your bags. Um, when you go to a car dealership, cause that was my first experience buying a car. And I think I, you know, I have traumatic stress sy- syndrome because of it to this day, because I can't stand it. This guy let me off in the heat, you know, in, in you know, November or some point. And I had about 15 people come swarming me um, and saying, like, this guy's not leaving without a car today. And I'm like, yeah. So, so uh, I, pur- I purchased a wonderful, you know, eight-year-old Honda Accord. And that was my vehicle for the next uh, two years, for the next year and a half before I wound up in Dallas. <laughs> and how did you end so, up there? Ooh, uh, again, you know, at this point in my life, Lance, I, uh, I was playing hockey, having a blast, uh, you know, just really enjoying what it was I was doing. I was making zero money, but I was loving the game. Um, the toughest part for me, honestly, was like, you're used to being with all your buddies at, you know, college and whatnot. And, you know, you're done with practice at one in the afternoon. So to fill your days with something productive to do between the hours of one and, you know, 10 o'clock at night, you got to be a little bit creative in those things. Like I went and took line dancing lessons. I, you know, spent time at libraries. Like I was doing all sorts wow. of crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would look in the paper and Friday night lights, you know, big Texas high school football. I would choose a game every week if I was in town and I'd go and like watch Friday night lights football in Houston, which was amazing. I got to be a huge high school football fan. Um, so that was like stuff that I was doing on the side and just, trying to keep myself, you know, active and busy and keeping my mind, you know, sharp and whatnot. But on the um, flip side, but on the flip side, there's yeah. a, there's another group of players that they're, they're, uh, they're at the bar, they're shooting pool, mm. having mm-hmm. beers, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. living a different every, life, you know, every day, like, every day, as you all know, you know? Um, so I was a little bit of the dork that I didn't do those things, but I'm like, I didn't care. You know, I was kind of comfortable in what I was doing and having fun, just being a part of the Houston Arrows. And our team was freaking awesome. Uh, we are kicking butt and taking names. Um, um, we played that year. We made it to the you know conference final. Had a great end of the season. I went back home and trained and did you know got ready to go. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden, uh, um, you know, I get a uh, we go to Las Vegas that second year I'm there. I'm just starting to learn the defensive position and, and at the professional level. Right. And I am, uh, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to get the real hang of this. I'm starting to be, you know, productive, you know, a quote unquote Tippett's giving me lots of kudos. Dave Barr is our defensive coach at the time. And he's working with me tons. We go to Las Vegas about, uh, in October, November of the year. And we have a game Monday night in Las Vegas, and they were in our conference at the time or a division or whatever they call it. And then we didn't play again until Friday. Well, that's a long time to be in Vegas, Lance. Um, we had some guys disappear for a few days. They weren't in the best of spirits, you know, and uh, health when they came to the rink for the Friday night game. We had a couple <laughs> guys getting some fights. Um, all of a sudden, Tippett looks down to the end of the bench and – he doesn't have any forwards. So he comes down and he says, Sloaney, you're going to play forward, you know, for a couple shifts. And I'm like, tip, I, I haven't played forward. Last time I played forward was when I was eight. And he goes, 
don't care. I need you down here. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, sir. Message received. So I go down there and I'm like, I remember my first shift playing forward. I was like, oh my gosh, what the heck is happening? Where am I? I'm like, I don't like these people behind me. Like, he's like, go get the gosh darn puck and make a play. So I end up playing that game. And apparently he thought I did a really good job because he started playing me at forward. Uh, you know, every other game we had guys hurt, injured, then I'd go back to D. Um, and then it turned into from a game to game situation. It turned into like, I'd play a couple shifts at, at D, uh, during a game. He said, Sloan, come down here. I need you at right wing. I go down and play right wing. He goes wow. back to D for a few shifts. I play. Finally, I got to the point where I was like, Dave, listen, I'm like, I'm not helping you in either position right now because I don't know how to prepare for this. You know? I said, can you help me and just say, like, give me an idea, like, if I'm going to be playing both, if I'm going to play on the back end, the forward end, what? And he's like, yeah, I can do that. So we had this agreement moving forward. Like, he was always uh, giving me a heads up on it. So the Kalam- Kalamazoo K Wings came into town and I prepared all week. And Kalamazoo was the farm club of Dallas at the time. I was preparing all week. We had two uh, defensemen that were injured. And all week I'm mm-hmm. playing D, playing D, playing D. And it tur- turns around uh, uh, Thursday night after practice. We have a practice till about one o'clock in the afternoon. And he comes to me and he says, Hey, you're going to play D or you're going to play forward all weekend. And I'm like, what? I'm like, we've got two D herb tip. Like, why am I playing forward? And he's like, don't worry about it. I said, I, I want you to play forward. We need you against this team. They, they've got some D we need you to get after and create some havoc. And I'm like, that's just what we're going to do. And I've got two defensemen I want to look at from Austin who I'm going to bring up. And so he kind of played it off, but in the background, from what I understand, some of the scouting staff had seen a couple games at me at forward and they asked Tippett to play me at forward in that weekend series because they were going to come down and watch the games. He obviously didn't want to tell me that uh, to, quote, unquote, make me nervous. Now, at this time, Lance, just to set the stage, the Houston Arrows were, I mean, we were like 50 and 12 in the IHL. And we oh, were wow. killing it. We were having an awesome year. And the Dallas Stars at this time were like 50 and 12. Like they were on a, they were on this collision course to win a Stanley cup. We were on a collision course to win the Turner cup. So like hockey in Texas right now is like crazy. Houston and Dallas are like, we're getting 12, 13,000 at our games or we're having a blast. It's fun. And there, and there's this other entity in Dallas. That's like, you know, this whole other thing, never in my wildest dreams. I swear to goodness on my life. uh, Did I ever think that, you know, there was the occasional comment, as you know, like, hey, you know, Dallas's brass is in the stands tonight with contracts in hands. But I was like, yeah, whatever. Like, that's not even, they're kicking ass and taking names. Okay. So so I had the weekend series. The team does well. My agent happened to be in town. Kurt was in that town that weekend. And we, you know, have some fun after and go to a couple, you know, establishments and have a beer or two, you know, nothing crazy. And on Monday, we've got tip gave us a, a day off on Monday. And, you know, I'm walking out of my apartment with my golf bag uh, to go because beautiful thing, you know, in uh, March at this time, you can go play golf. It's freaking outstanding. Um, And I'm like, my phone rings and Kurt had just left uh, to go to the airport. And he calls me, he says, Sloaney, what are you doing? I'm like, Kurt, I'm going to be late for a tea time. A couple of the boys are going to meet me. Uh, And he's like, well, you can't go to the airport for a little, or you can't go to the golf course for a little bit. And I said, Kurt, I just saw you. I got to go. I'll talk to you later. He goes, no, no, Sloney. Bob Gainey is going to call you in about 10 minutes. And I'm like, Bob Gainey from the Dallas Stars? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, "Uh, why? And he's (laughs) like, (laughs) that's what I said. I said, like, why? And he's like, well, he would like to talk to you about coming to Dallas and playing for them. And I'm like, I literally said it out loud to Kurt. I'm like, what, to carry their stick bags? (laughs) <laughs> and he's like, no, he thinks like they came this weekend. They watched you play. They think you can add something to the team, uh, you know, something that they're lacking. And, uh, you know, he's like, he, he'd like to call you. And I'm like, uh, okay. Wow. So five minutes later, Bob calls me on my ring phone in my hotel, in my apartment, my condo apartment or whatever. And he says, you know, says who he is. And he said, what, what do you, what do you think you can help us do? And I, you know, told, said, I, 
I'm not sure, Bob. You guys are a pretty talented hockey club, uh, but I think I can just provide you some energy, some quickness, and I'll just try to do my best. <laughs> you yeah, know, like yeah. one of those type of things. I mean, what do you? <laughs> what's he? What's he looking for there? You know. Yeah. Um, and Bob was very much like Red. They're cut from the same cloth, and that's why I was really fortunate to have played for a guy like Red. Um, so he said, "Hey, I'll work out the details with Kurt." He said, I'd like you at practice tomorrow morning, you know, at 10 a.m., pack up your stuff and leave. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I called Tippett right away. And, you know, he's like, yeah, I know. And I said, well, Dave, I said, I don't think I should go. I'm like, you know, I we have a great team here. We're going to win a Turner Cup. I'm playing a ton. Like, this is really fun. He's like, Sloney. He's like, if you were at practice tomorrow, I will drag you off the ice and drive you to Dallas myself. So yeah. please. Go to Dallas. I don't want to see you again the rest of the year. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. Said, okay, Tim. So uh, cool. they ended up winning the Turner Cup. We won the Stanley Cup. I ended up uh, playing in 19 of the 21 playoff games. I, I played, you know, basically 12 regular season games and then played almost every game in the playoffs and, um, you know, did my thing and was fortunate to get dragged along on a pretty unbelievable ride. That... <laughs> That's an unbelievable story. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's crazy. It, it doesn't make sense even talking about it, to be honest, Lance. So, oh, well, I know that uh, I, I want to dive deeper into that, and maybe you would be so kind to come back on. We had a little technical difficulty, but I know you have a, a hard stop here, and you didn't even have time to have lunch. You had a little smoothie, so. Probably got to take a pee or something before your meeting at 2.30. But um, how about we end it now? And my hope is to have you back on again. Um, I guess I just I want to congratulate you on an amazing hockey life so far, what you've shared. Uh, nothing was ever given to you. You know, your story is authentic. It's genuine. Uh, has great messaging. And I guess if... If I was the parent of a young hockey hopeful out there uh, and was looking for someone to study or have my kids study to to go from good to great, Mr. Blake Sloan is someone I would highly recommend. <laughs> I would highly recommend. So, Mr. Sloan, thanks for sharing your hockey journey with the listeners. They're going to love it. I, uh, I appreciate it, and I'd be more than happy to come back on. I, I think the biggest piece of the story and the most uh, – interesting piece isn't to be honest the hockey stuff lands to me it's uh it's the transition after um as you well know it's 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 a very very difficult and trying time to transition after doing something you've done for such a long time my father-in-law was a dentist for 40 years and i said jeff what would happen if someone came in and said you can no longer practice dentistry after 19 years of practicing what would you do and he looked at me like with this blank don't want a headlights look and he goes Oh my gosh. I don't know. I'd probably go crazy. And yeah. I said, yeah. So think about that, you know, for your listeners out there. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have found the company that I've worked for to this day. Uh, but that transition and that lifestyle, uh, it, it, there'll never be anything like that in my life again. So how do you channel those energies to something positive and delivering those great messages? And that's why I'm so involved with hockey. Now I, the coaching for me has been a great outlet. Uh, I've coached at youth hockey now for a long time and uh, business wise has been fantastic. And uh, my family is obviously a blessing for me as well. So uh, next time we can dig into all that. How's that? No, I think that that's, uh, and I agree with you. Um, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff that's uh, you've been thinking about a lot um, have made part of your life and, have packaged it all together to where if you're in in front of some young impressionable person, you know, you're having a consistent messaging, uh, trying to, you know, just guide these young people in the, the path that we we all hope that they go on. Because as you said, 100%. It's, it's a big, it's a team effort, my friend. Yeah, it's always, it's always a team effort. Yeah. So sp yeah. speaking of the team, I appreciate the great questions and thanks for having me, Lance. I really appreciate it, man. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll get in touch with you. Let's do this uh, again because I don't want to have it like months away, but uh, I'll text you after. But thanks again for being here. And um, 
you know, I know you're going to be golfing here. You probably already have, but uh, the snow's just started to melt. Uh, have a great uh, rest of your week here and weekend, and hopefully our paths will cross in the near future. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed hearing part one of the Hockey Journey of Blake Sloan and what a journey it was. That was an awesome conversation, and I look forward to part two in the near future. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon, and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.